Okay, so uh, so I'll just show you the start of this. You may have seen this, but it's uh, it pertains deeply to our. Uh, you hear this? Won a Pentagon challenge to find ten red balloons. Now, if only we get Osama bin Laden to carry a red balloon. Please welcome Dr. Riley Crane. You can watch this later. Okay, so you should, if you haven't watched it, you should watch that. But basically, this, this, the arc of the story of the small world thing has you know, reached its summit because now it's on, it, you know, it got to the Colbert. Um, that's just my point of view. So, um, very amusing. Anyway, it's a, good, it's a good interview. I think he asked him about it, you know, whether this whole thing's a Ponzi scheme and you know, how you can make money out of it, right? If you haven't. So, that would be his thing. Uh, this is just for amusement. You know, I papers on networks just appear all the time. This is sort of appealing to me. So this is universal properties of mythological networks. So this is this just sort of came across the uh, story the other day. But it, you guys will, will, you know, now you can kind of, you, you are familiar with these things now. So let me get rid of that. Yeah. So, you know, they talk about all these things, clustering, the degree distribution and so on, but they're looking at how characters connect to each other. And so it's Beowulf and uh, the Iliad and and I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a, an Irish uh, pain. It's uh, you know, thought to, that's thought to be completely fictional, right? So they're, they're trying to figure out from how these characters are connected to each other whether uh, you know, they can show that this is this, this has some char some characteristics that's separated out from, say, the Iliad and Beowulf, which are based on some some real events at least, right? So clustering coefficients, and they measure assortativity. These things. Which in my next course, complex networks, we we really get into. But there you go. So they're trying to get a narrative, which is which is our you know big thing we're trying to get to as well. Uh, okay, so I was going to talk today about um, you know I don't think I oh that's right that's right that's right. So I have to do the rest of small world networks. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. Ah, so I'm going to have to zip through it because that is I don't have a link to it. All right, so we went through the experiment. We went through the red balloon thing. We reached the summit of Colbert. And then we got to this question of, um, yeah, right. So how do we, we started this off. How do we understand this model? And we got to get right. I was also going to show you. So, you know, of course, I keep putting these videos up and I have a nice new introduction for the last one. I should look at it. Um, okay, so this, this, so this is Watson Strogatz. This is just a toy model, right? This is just the toy model, which, which is for getting, you know, ideas and stories out of it. Uh, oddly enough, it's been used quite exactly in this way to do some things, such as synchronize supercomputers, some work done out of RPI, uh, where they really use this toy model to. So instead of having Many, many links or you know, some random wiring and so on. But, but basically, if everything was fully connected, you could imagine having a pretty good um, communication system. Right? That's overloading things too much. Uh, it turns out that this intermediary kind of structure that has clustering and these random links, which give, gives it a, this small world property while still being social. Some very abstract sense. So that's their work. And we got to this point. Are these shortcuts? They should, right? So that's how you need to that's how you need to move around uh, speedily, if you like. They're the ones you have to jump on. There's a local structure that you navigate around. Uh, but now and then you'll have to jump on one of these big hops. But they're not final. So with using a local algorithm, right? So you're sitting in this network and you know who your friends are, and you know what their identities are, right? So that's what I mean by knowing who your friends are. You might know, say, how many friends they have, right? So who's popular and so on. Um, so you might have some idea if you're trying to get to a target person who has some identity, which person to, to move the message towards, right? So, okay. um, but you don't know anything really about their friends, right? Or certainly friends of their, you know, you're, so you're friends of friends and then friends of friends of friends. So three steps out is a long, long way in a social universe. We talk about six degrees of separation, but six is a huge number in a, in a network. It's actually a really big number. It sounds small because it's small. In a lot of other ways, six apples is not many apples, but um, 
Uh, six is a really big number in terms of steps and hops. All right, so that's what I mean by local search method. So we'll see what people have done to try and work this out. And we have some work that I'll go through as well. Um, I need my little clip here. Yeah. Anything to plug in? All right. So you can't do this, and th this was pointed out by uh, John McClain, but um, it was a Cornell, very nice guy, this one. Um, I like to say that every time. So he's a MacArthur genius. So, so we need a more sophisticated model. But it, this has got the flavor of Mac. Is there a proof for the note? Like yeah. The that we can't find yeah. So some technical work by um, Kleinberg, and I'll point to his work and in, in, in want to show you this. But yes. So, but. It takes it up to, you know, as with the scale. So you talk about the scaling, right? So as these systems get bigger. So if you go back to these, right, we have n nodes, and you might say, all right, let's fix the number of friends they have, and we'll fix this p somewhere, or we might play around with it. So we we build a family of these guys, but then we increase n. So we think about what happens as this thing gets larger. Um, it turns out, as a function of n, the search time, the best search for the best kind of search which we'll get to, uh, scales uh, as a power of n, right? So it's scales and point over. So it, it's not great. But there, there's, it's detailed work by uh, Kleinberg. But I will, I will come to it. All right, so we need a more sophisticated model uh, that somehow includes a couple of things. Um, so what do you put, so I've mentioned these things. What do you put into a local search? Right? You're just an individual. You only know about your friends. Um, and so essentially you don't have a map. So we'll see, we'll see some sort of moving around uh, this idea of having a map or not having a map. Uh, and so somehow, you, without a map, you need some measure of distance. So how do you do that? You don't really, you don't have a, uh, you know, like a geographic map where Google tells you how to get there or if you have a real, you know, an old map. An old map, you can figure it out yourself. You can see these lines. Uh, so the things you might know, of course, the target's identity, and, and you might know this to more or less. So in, in our experiment, for example, we put in the target's name, the city they were living in, and their profession. Not much. Uh, so as I said, popularity, you will know more than that. You'll know something about their identities. These are all things you can dial in or out if you like. Um, and and here's an extra piece, where the message is being. So that's not a bad thing, right? So the message, as it's moving through the network, just as it did with Milgram's original experiment, you could have, you could see where it's been. So you could at least not send it back to this. The person who sent it to you, that would be silly. But maybe you know the person who came from before them, there's some triangle there. Uh, you don't want to send it to them either. All right. So that stops from heffalumping. So it turns out to be a very viable, uh, Thing to use again. All right, so there you go. So John Clark, let's, let's look at what he did. So this is this is published in Nature. That's nice. It's a one-page piece in. Uh, I think it's a one-page piece in, in Nature. And back in 2000, so the original piece is 98 with Watson Strogatz. Huge amount of work just takes off after that. Uh, and we'll see how far we get. But I, I, we'll get it. We'll get some way into scale for networks. So that's 99 today. So. So this was a very clever thing. He, so, so John comes up with this idea of, of varying both the search algorithm, really thinking about it, which was not part of the original work, and uh, the network structure. And so he, he looks at a whole different ensemble of networks. Uh, so it's going to be a, a very, it's going to look a bit like that two-dimensional one that I showed you. Okay, so it's a bit more in that game, which we know is not really a social network. So a d-dimensional cubic lattice. So, because we can, we look at d dimensions, why not? We'll do it all at once. And I probably should add more to these slides, but let's see. So, here's, here's what he did. So, that's, that's set up. So, you have in sort of two dimensions, you have four numbers. And then uh, you go to uh, every node, and you do this thing that is in the Watson Strogatz model. You add, you ramify locally, right? So, you add some extra links locally. So, you might say around each node, there's some distance q, and measure that in different ways, we're going to add links to everyone within that distance q. So we'll start supporting them. And so that happens everywhere, so locally you get this, this clustering. Right? So that's in there. And then you add m shortcuts per node. So this is a 
several extra steps. Now we're going to add the shortcuts on top. So it's, it's still in the same flavor as before with this what's struggle model, where that was whereas that was rewiring, this is adding links. So now we're adding links on top. So we're going to add some these shorts by shortcuts within these long distance ones. Each node will get M. And we'll do it instead of this rewiring idea that we had before, we're going to add them and we're going to add them with this decaying probability as a function of distance. And because we're on a d-dimensional lattice, we're in space. Distance is here, right? So we know what we know what the distance is. So there is a bit of a here we're allowing some problem for ourselves. So let's say this is the start person and this is the target. Then we actually have their we have their uh, their positions, right? So this this one we could say is let's say it's um, two one. That's their position. This one is two three four five six. I can count. This is six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. So I made it six. All right, all right. Uh, so this is the starting node. You tell them to get into this target person. They actually know that they can just go hop, 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 right? Because they actually know the whole layout of this place. Right. Just so we understand that. That was not true in the original one. You're on the spring lattice. You have no sense of space with that. You just have your local connections. Here, you actually know that you're embedded in some space. So there's always this possibility that if you can't see a, a way to get, so if these are your, this, this person here just has these two friends, they just choose between, randomly between them. Right? So they're going to either say, go here or here with half a chance. Both are helping, right? They're not going to move it this way. On the other hand, if they have a link, they have a couple of short cuts and maybe one goes here, one goes here like this, then they will definitely do this one. They can make this at all that they're measuring the distance, so the distance from on a Manhattan metric, if you like, so the number of hops it takes to get from here to here will be shorter than the number of hops from other friends. So, uh, so, so, so we are really putting a, a very concrete idea of distance. Um, so what's this SIG? It's frequency of something. Yeah, so that's the that's the that's the distance. Just writing this is the distance between node i and node j, and I know I've got an i and j here. But uh, if we if we call this node i and this node j, the distance is how many hops. So it's decaying, and this is a tunable exponent, right? So we should stick up our So it's decaying as a as some power. So that has a couple of features. But now for zero, the random connections, the random connections, because the probability of connecting to node j is Uniform, right? You know, you normalize it. You you create this uh, weight, these weights for all of the nodes. So you're at node i. You give this. You get a weight for each node that's some distance away from you. you sum up all those weights and normalize it to get a proper probability. Right? So you have to do that every time, which is a bit hard for a normal node to do, but that's the way it's done. Um, and then uh, alpha large. So that's that's going to make the decay very sharp. So you're just going to be reinforcing local connections. Okay. And in between, uh, so alpha equals d, you have to think about this a little bit, but alpha, now you've got the connections growing um, logarithmically. So you have some, you have the same amount, say, uh, at say, say distance 2 as you have at distance 4, as you have at distance 8, 16, 32. Like the shortcuts also are local. So the shortcuts, there's a bias, yeah, so, so you can get, but you can get purely random ones, which gives you back the kind of flavor of the watt strogatz model. So the watt strogatz model only had local connections and global, global connections. It just had these two scales. You had local kind of connections and then just random ones, which we can sort of think of as being global. I just wanted to make sure, so XIJ is measured as half length is traversed along the links, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you, you take what's called the Manhattan metric, okay. which is the number of, if you were a taxi driving around, yeah, above the house thing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do it in different ways, but that's, that's, that's a fine natural way to do it. It's how many. 
you've got this little message that needs to go along, there's how many hops it needs to be. How many hops? So there's some in between this. There's this one that makes it local, there's one that gives you kind of the what struggle flavor, and there's one that uh, somewhere in between, which gives you connections at all scales, which is a pillar. Right? So you've got roughly the same amount as you go out logarithmically in this place. So this is this social golf kind of idea. Right? So it turns out, and I'm, you know, I can't put everything out, I'll go into some details with some of these models, but uh, so Kleinberg found allowed actually searched for all possible algorithms with this information. So that's pretty good work. Right? Where they're using so every algorithm is using local information to do the search. So it turns out the greedy one is best. What you might think is best. The greedy one is the one that simply doesn't do any funny waiting or anything. It finds it, it sends the message to the, your neighbor, your your friend who's closest to the target. That's it. It does what Seems entirely reasonable, right? So it might be that that's bad because uh, let's say from here, let's say this guy actually has a connection here. So in fact, if you've gone to here, then hop, right? But you don't know that. And so it's locally good, but globally not the best, right? So if you have the big picture here and you know this link, you just say, oh, we should just do this. That's not how we actually, we don't have that information. This note, the start node does not know about that thing. Uh, and so it's a greedy algorithm. So this is about the algorithm you choose. But the best network for search is this one that has these links to all scales. It's the one that has alpha equals d. So that's, so where you're just ramifying locally, you're just adding links, small links locally, that doesn't help, which should make sense, right? You still get the grid structure. You're still just putting in links locally. You've still got when you scale out, when you renormalize, if you like, it's still a big grid thing. If you're adding random links everywhere, that's okay. That gives you something, but they're unfindable. Right? They're not. They're not easy to find. You don't have any sense of them. What this is saying is that each node will have some long links. Or, you know, roughly on average, you'll have some long links. You'll have some that are intermediate links. Some that are even closer. And so the idea is that you really do have something where you can smash the, the uh, message like a golf ball uh, a long distance, and maybe you get it to here, and there you can pull out a, you know, an iron or a, you know, a wedge and a putter because you actually have a, a net, you actually have those in your back because your network kind of somehow reflects a bag of golf balls. It's not too bad an analogy, except it's actually to golf, which is a terrible sport. So, <laughs> flog, right? Flog backwards. <coughs> Mark Twain said, I think, right? It's a good walk spoil. Mark Twain would have loved Twitter, I have to say. But a good walk spoil. There you go. Um, absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, so, uh, uh, search time grows slowly. So, that's what we're after. So as the size of these systems grows, it grows log, um, very slowly. It's actually a log squared of n. And that's only at that very special kind of network. Right? So as you move away from that structure, as you dial alpha towards more of a local reinforcement or a way to more of a global random kind of adding of links, you lose this, this specialness. So it's a bit of a special thing. But, but very good. So this you know, changed the game. People started to think. You know, in retrospect, of course, many things are obvious. Uh, and when we say it just so, it all seems obvious, but we were a little stuck before that. And because the ge geometric thing was fantastic, right? I mean, we went out and measured, they measured everything Marvel, uh, comics, you know, you know, uh, brains of, 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 uh, of uh, um, worms, right? That was actually in the first paper. But just everything you could think of, like, oh, let's measure the clustering, compare it to a random network. Measure the average for this path, path line connect, you know, compare that to a random network, and we have a small world. It's just super exciting. Um, so we got to understand that that's, happens a lot, and it's very effective. It's a good thing in many ways. So uh, the search time here, pair of nodes, the average of On average for randomly selected pair of nodes, yeah. For random, randomly selected search node and target node, yeah. So, as this thing scales, yeah. And it's in a box. Right. 
So there's some constraint, right? So it's n to the 1 over d numbers along each side of nodes, right? And then you let that get bigger. And of course, randomly selected nodes then will be growing further and further apart on average. All right, so that's, that's a, so this shifts the story into thinking about algorithms, as well as just the structure, but it's, it actually has this very interesting result that some networks are more searchable than others, right? They're more navigable than others. So there's the possibility that it's not just the algorithm you're using, but it's the fact that the network has evolved potentially over time, or just by happenstance has a particular searchable nature to it. So we want to see what this means for social networks. And then possibly, you know, how do you structure informational networks as well? Uh, so if they have hubs, and we're going to come to hubs more uh, soon, but they have hubs, meaning, meaning nodes that are very well connected. And there's a searchability to those things as well. And so we'll get to this. This is a Barabazi Albert story. Uh, but if they have a degree distribution with, as we, we know all about these guys now, um, that decays as a, as a power law, then Pretty simple. So the idea is you get to the hubs first. It's like getting, right, it's like traveling around the US or around the world. You get to a hub on an, uh, an airline and then that can take you to many places. So, so if you think about the hub structure for, for airlines, it's very clever, right? So it's ideally you'd have a flight that goes from every, you know, every airport to every other airport. That would be terrific, right? And you just get on your flight from some random place to some random place because that's what you want. But you can, obviously it's insane and expensive, and there'd be a lot of flights with no one on them. But if you um, build in a few hubs, then you can still get to where you want to in a couple of hubs, two or three hubs, um, which, is, which is remarkably good, with basically no links compared to what a fully connected network is. Right? So a fully connected network has n, n squared on the order of n squared, uh, <laughs> another squirrel, um, n squared uh, links in it. But you can have very much, much fewer. On the order of n links will do the job for you. So that's, you know, that's great. All right, so this is a, it's a lot of, I'm going to say Adamich. I know her name is Adamich now. But uh, Adamich was a terrific, done all sorts of fantastic things. Um, this, is, this is a very nice piece. Uh, but hubs in social networks are limited, right? So in real social networks, where you have a real friend who is a real person who will respond to you and send something out. You can send your link to Oprah on Twitter and say, hey, I want you to send this message to some arbitrary person for no reward. Uh, it's not going to happen. Right? So um, you try. Anyway, so uh, because that's not a reciprocated, real kind of link, you may think it's real, but Oprah. OK, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so, let's, so that, that's the setup for this. So. That work was, so that work was 2001, climate was 2000. We'll go to what we call generalized affiliation networks. Um, it's a whole beautiful uh, area of work on bipartite um, affiliation networks, which, which I'll mention here a little bit, but we'll, we'll, go, we'll go into that much more complex network experiments. Um, and very reasonable and practical. And re OK, so we'll get to it. So how do you do this if you don't have a map, right? So, so the Kleinberg story had a map. Adamic had this particular kind of network, which again, we sort of would say is not really what social networks are like. Uh, uh, and also the search time that is not super, super fast. Right? It turns out to be great if there are really, really gigantic hubs in those networks. So it makes sense, right? So if you have a pure star network where there's one central figure and everyone else is connected to them, then you just send it to the central person. And they, they'll re reroute, right? That person, of course, explodes pretty quickly. Um, and it's just not a real network unless it's a small cop. OK. Um, oh, it's fine. So which, uh, so, which friend of you, so which friend in here? So, all right, so A has other friends here. You can't see. How does A figure out that they should go to here? Like, that is, in some sense, the, fast, the, the closest person. And we know they're going to get it wrong as well. But that, Example I have here. This this friend here is actually not the part of the shortest path from start to, to target. This one is. Right, so they're not they're not going to be able to see this. So they have to do pretty well. So what does closest mean? What is social distance? What's a what's a measure of social distance? We're not seeing a top of a grid. 
So we, this is the story. We think about identity. Again, this will probably seem very reasonable afterwards. But, uh, and, and you can see how this connects into the experiment, although this was published first. So geographic location, what people do, their beliefs, what, you know, what activities they're involved in. These are the things that bring them into contact with other people. And bring them into contact with other activities and behaviors as well. So there's a slow evolution of the things that you do, that you associate with. Uh, you may become friends with some group, and then maybe they have some other things that they do that you become involved in. Uh, and, and we'll say this, right? So, so if, um, if you have some attribute that's in, in common with others, we'll, we'll say that you're this kind of a grouping there. So it could be pretty weak, uh, so that you just simply live in the same area. But then if you add a few more other pieces to that, that you maybe you have the same religion, you, have to, you work at the same place, right? It starts to make your potential for connecting much stronger. So this is all very reasonable. So this is interaction, as I was trying to say there, between the attributes of individuals, which can change, the context they find themselves in, that they put themselves into, the kind of interactions they have with other people, and then the net social networks that are realized out of this. And we have a bit of a tendency to say we want to kind of pull these social these networks out of some magic model um, kind of thing, you know, in some way. But really, we need to be looking at the, a much more complete model, especially for social networks, where we where we have the context. They don't go over. So uh, here's a, here's a, as I was talking about this bipartite uh, population, there's some very nice work recently on food recipes. So Lada uh, Adamic is part of that. Uh, one paper, there's some work by uh, Barabazi Group as well, I think, um, where these are ingredients and these are recipes. Right? And so then you have this kind of fun thing where you can see which, uh, which ingredients are, are tied together. What you do is you take the recipes away, and then you have a, an ingredient network. Right? They're connected to each other by dint of the fact that they're in the same uh, recipe. Or you can have a recipe network. You take away this side, and you look at this side. You shouldn't take it away completely. You should never sort of forget about one piece. Though. OK, boards of directors. Uh, so this could be the, uh, the directors and the, the boards up here, uh, movies or actors, lots of different things. Right? Could be classes and students. Right? These are the ways of meeting each other. Um, but this is so, sorry. So this is the realization of, of that network. So we have A and B are connected to each other because they share this one context. So we're going to say that if they share a context, they're actually connected. You can make this probabilistic and look at real things, of course, um, to see how well this holds up. But B is connected to, as we saw, A, but also D. C has a bunch of connections. And uh, this, the idea here is that if we put in an extra uh, association for E, so it's associated with 3 here. If we add that, so now, so in the, in the initial network that's realized from this, the union part, part type network, for like C and E were only the, so E was only connected to C, so that's E only has its one frame. So now they start interacting in 3, and you could say because C said come to, you know, uh, whatever it is, chess or Dungeons and Dragons, you know, like we have this great thing over here, or, um, you know, whatever. Is there a cult? This three could be a cult. And, um, and uh, we dress up in funny clothes. Which were? Mason's. Oh, yeah, all right. Freemasons. Interesting story. I actually had a serious question now. Okay, these, sorry. That is very serious. <laughs> we, oh. No screens. <laughs> we love the Freemasons. Okay. Are, are these necessarily reversible? I'm just thinking about that paper with um, ingredients and flavor compounds where they use flavor compounds to form connections between ingredients. Yes. But it's not necessarily right. sensible to reverse that because flavor compounds are found everywhere in trace amounts. And yeah. so is there a, like a reversibility criteria? So you mean it might not be interesting to look at the flavor network? Well, yeah. It, it, it kind of gets problematic if you think, okay, well, what if we look at the flavor compounds that are shared between the ingredients? Yeah, and yeah. Say, okay, that well, might just not be useful. Okay. okay. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm just wondering if, if that says something about the structure of a bipartite network and doesn't make sense the other way. That's fine. Uh, it's just that you wouldn't want to ever remove all of the information. You, so, you, so the end result is you want to look at how the ingredients are connected to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you do that, but you still keep this. Okay. Right. So that's, that's the idea, is we're, we're interested in how the people are connected. It could go both ways, right? Okay. So it could be it could, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, which books people read. You know, that may then tell you which books are 
similar to each other, or which people are similar to each other. Maybe you know, so on Amazon, you really only care about it. As a, as a, as a consumer, you're interested in the books. Right. And I think something like Goodreads, for example, it goes a little further and says, these books are connected because people have similar responses to them, but these reviewers are connected as well. So you might want to look at Right. OK. Uh, yeah. 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 Which seems great, and, and that's useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not down by. So yeah, good point. Um, so so not always useful to go the other ways, but um, but this is really often the structure of things. So how's that sound? Good. Super super. So here's the way to uh, expand that a little bit. So now we have our A B C D E, and these are the individuals, and this is a profession here, right? So we have a high school teacher, a kindergarten teacher. So they're in education. So this we can imagine some hierarchical structure in this is identity. Yeah, this is conceptually makes sense. Uh, healthcare over here, you have nurse and doctor, and this is all about occupation. So you, know, you think of these two as being more, more closely connected. And we can start to figure out how really this is structured, how this kind of occupation uh, tree is structured. Um, but and that is, that is difficult, there's been some work, again, Lada actually has done some of it. Uh, but let's just say it's a hierarchy. This is what we do. And uh, we'll, we'll abstract it away. We'll even say geography is kind of a hierarchy. Geography is tricky. Geography is not what it used to be, right? You used to have to, of course, a long time ago, you'd have to walk from one place to the other. Then we get the horse thing sorted out, and cars, and then the whole flying tubes thing, the magic flying tubes. Um, True, right? I mean, flying is insane. You're in a tube, and then you get out and you're somewhere else. Okay, so um, let's, let's, let's think about how this works. So this is an abstraction. So we have a hierarchy. We're going to imagine each hop up this hierarchy as being sort of an equal weight. So the groups here, they have uh, size 6. There's a node, um, looks like a new to me. But it's supposed to be sort of a V, there's an I, K, and a J. So we're going to see how well these guys are connected. So um, the distance between I and J, well, what we do is we go up the tree. And so we imagine everyone who's in the same group has a distance of 1. And so you imagine there's like a little tree here as well. But if you have to go up and then up again, then the distance between I and J is 3. The distance between I and K is 1, so that's good. Uh, just between I and this node over here, V, you have to go 1, 2, 3, 4 to get to it. Uh, the least common ancestor, or the lowest common ancestor. Right, so it hops up here. This is a tree with a branching ratio of 2. Uh, you could, that's pretty extreme, right? So that's the most extreme case. You could imagine, of course, real ones having will have some sort of different kinds of branching radio ratios. Uh, you know, so this is a taxonomy. Right, there's some natural taxonomy that emerges for things. Right? Um, I have a practical question. Um, what did you use to make the interpreter? I mean, nodes and trees. What, what's that? It what? seems like there, there must be a piece of software out there very common to make diagrams. Like to make this that. thing? Yeah, is there something oh. that you use? Well, of course, I could talk about how to do this. Thing, right? But this is, this is from the glorious X figure. Which is, which is an ancient X uh, um, you know, drawing apparatus. It is a has a horrific interface, but you can kind of do everything. With it. So, okay, so there are some new ones around that are maybe a little better, but uh, I still use it. Okay, so you it's disgusting. You drew the tree by hand. Is what you're saying. There's no you didn't put parameters. No, no. This is a, this is just a, this is just an example. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Interface LaTeX really, really good, but just horrible to use. Oh. Uh, anyway, yeah, XP. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some things that are, Inkscape, I think, is, is a good thing now, right? That has nice kind of, yeah, Inkscape is all very lovely. You can put, you can put the text straight into yeah. Inkscape. Yeah. yeah, so I have bizarre little scripts that make, so you, you do that dollar sign, blah, 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 in this thing, and then you export it out, and then you have to run it through something, and eventually you get a PDF out. But um, yeah, yeah, right. I'm as old as Unix. OK, so literally, actually. Uh, all right, so yeah, that didn't come out for free. We'll have some more. Uh, 
it's 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 really powerful, but it's very exciting. Okay. So basic story, they're more, people are more likely to know each other if they're down and close to each other in this hierarchy, and we'll do something very similar to what Feinberg did, so you can see we're all kind of marching out from the same idea in some ways. Uh, we'll have an exponential decay because there's kind of a, 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 a power or kind of growth as you go up in these things anyway. So we'll, we'll do this. Uh, there's an exponential decay that we have some exponent alpha as a function of this distance between nodes as for their height in this, the lowest common ancestor in the trip, height of the lowest common ancestor. So again, we get this story, alpha equals zero, then this is just a constant when we normalize everything, the chance of you connecting to any other node is going to be uniform. Of course, there are more nodes further away from you in the tree, so it's that. But they're random connections. Uh, and alpha is large, you're starting to get, again, we have that ramifying or reinforcing of, of local connections. Good stuff. All right. And then there's some alpha in between where you're starting to kind of add links locally, the next group up, the next group up, the next group up, somewhat uniform. Although that's a little strange, right? So you, you don't really want to have uh, as many friends in this town as you do in the state, as you do in the country, as you do in you know, North America or something. Like, that's a little bit of We're going to have a little more reinforcement locally. Yeah, right, so, so, so certainly within this occupation tree, we're not going to have random links across it. That's the point of it. It's, you can see from it that your link should be by dint of that particular um, dimension of your uh, identity, you're going to have more links locally. All right, so here's the uh, expert. Not the best, and this is for a long time ago. Getting better. Um, <laughs> do this thing. Uh, so, geography, you know, this is kind of crazy. Occupation, age. Uh, I have to say, for a long time, I thought about how we could uh, do a nice job of saying, let's start in New York City, travel around on all the flights coming out of there, and we'll keep going. And then, in a sense, count up how many places you can get to as a function of time of travel. Right? So that you have this. So if we're, if we're out, in the, out in the desert, trying to find God, or what do we do out in the desert? We're trying to do that, and then we sort of we go for a wonder, right? Um, turns out it's good because we are going. So you, know, you realize that about here when you're really thirsty. So um, <laughs> then you have some doubts, and then you, you, know, then you think you're a giant frog. And then it's a low <laughs> yeah. um, Anyway, you're wandering through the desert. So what you see is how many places you get to in a certain time, you're walking, right? let's say you've got a constant walking, right? It is linear with the amount of time that you've gone. Right? So that, that tells you it's a, you're living in a two-dimensional world. But if you're living in New York City, and you can take these flights, and then you start walking or driving from those places, the number of places you can get to in a certain time is much larger and possibly grows exponentially. Right? But you can imagine, this is, this is a two-dimensional world. What dimension is it locally for all this? But if you're on the Tibetan plateau with maybe some skis, then you're going to find it pretty two-dimensional two locally. Right? Out in the middle of Antarctica with a bunch of penguins, it's going to feel pretty two-dimensional until you get to a base and you can fly somewhere. Then you suddenly in you know, a bigger dimensional world. Penguins all about that. Um, so you can do this, and in fact, so there's some work now by Brockman. We'll come back to this stuff a little bit potentially. Uh, that that basically does this. Right? So you want to look at you know, maybe Paris, or look at any uh, the big cities around the world. And you have all these element patterns, and you can see what the local dimension is as you move away from. Um, that's not what they do. They they think about how things spread. So how badly uh, could a disease drop into Hong Kong, which SARS, for example, how much could that spread? Right? Depends on the disease, how quickly. Uh, and there's lots of other work on that for, for LA networks. It's, so it's basically we're kind of screwed, actually. <laughs> um, uh, we're so connected now. Um, you know, of course, when we got ships, we happily went to other places and spread horrible diseases everywhere. We're, we, we've done it. But um, new ones are the ones we seem to be worried about now. Okay, so geography is weird, right? So that's what I'm trying to say. It's not a two-dimensional thing. We can kind of think of it. We can put it in the same. It's, this is a toy model. We're going to put it in the same box of hierarchy. Uh, occupation, we've sort of talked about, we've suggested that makes sense. Age, well, you can put, it on a, you can put that on a, a linear scale. So you can imagine that all of these dimensions, all of these aspects of identity have some kind of local structure to them. Right? There's some space that they come from. 
age population, this, but you might want to clump things like teenagers are in one box. And, yeah, that might make sense too. So you're more likely to connect to people uh, locally. Maybe there's a logarithmic thing here as well. But it, the point is, you know, we, we, that's something that at this point is beyond what we're doing. It's empirical, right? You, you need to kind of go, go there. So what we did is we just took hierarchy, essentially. Uh, and this connects deeply into lots of work uh, from, from the past in sociology going back 100 years. Uh, and so Google, Google Plus, actually, which we'll talk about is excellent, but don't use uh, uh, you know, it has this idea of circles, and it's actually a very nice reflection of how people think. So, how's, how's social groups work? All right, so we're going to expand a little bit. So the point is we have this one example of a hierarchy, but of course we have multiple ones, right? So we have, this is potentially geography, this is potentially work. Um, these are, you know, this is your, um, you know, the kind of, uh, kind of um, television shows you watch or something like that, right? So or religion, whatever it is. So some of the way, some of the dimension. And these things will be correlated in some way, of course. This is too hard for this model. So you see, we're kind of trying to get a little more flavor of, of the real world, uh, but we won't get all of it. So let's say I then lives, has these attributes. They're at this point in this hierarchy, this point over here, and this point here. But J in the first hierarchy is very different. Of course, geography is going to be a strong thing. We're going to give it the same weight as everything else, but geography is really sort of a set of this. So acknowledging all these problems. So Jay's uh, a little bit closer here, and it's a little bit closer here. So much closer here. So we can give them, so now we can kind of you know, make it into a simple model. We'll give them the positions of I, 1, 1, 1. It's in group 1 in these ones. Uh, v is in groups 8, 4, and 1. And so the distance between them, so this is the distance in dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three, so it's, it's four, right? If you go up the hierarchy all the way to come down to the other one, it's three over here. They're in the same uh, sub-branch, and it's only one here because they're in the same group. And then, so what we'll do is this very simple thing, is we'll say social distance is a minimum across all of those dimensions. Right? So if you match up with one category, then you've got a distance of one. So this gives us now a way of measuring social distance. Right? So if a target person is someone who lives in Boston, is a lawyer, um, and likes chickens, if you know someone who likes chickens, then you decide that that person's distance from the target is one, even though they might be a you know, I don't know, a garbage collector and they live in Tucson. Right? It's probably not a good choice. But, but our silly model will say that they have a distance of one, because they match up in one action. If they collect ferrets, then that might be a distance of two from the chicken collectors, right? So from the same top box. I got weird this one. Let's say chicken figurines and uh, ferret figurines. So that's going to be a small box. They could probably talk to each other about figurines. Uh, so here's a nice thing that's been noticed in the past and talked about. It, it, it certainly comes out of this some weird space we're building. Uh, the triangle inequality doesn't hold, so let's see if we can remember what that is. <laughs> you, you guys can remember that. So I, J, and K. So here is I in this first dimension. J and K are over here. They're buds on, on this side. I and J are buds here. But in both of these spaces, I and K are a long way apart. They're a long way apart. So we're going to say that, uh, so Y was, the, y was the overall social distance, right? The X is, the, there's an X for each one. So the x for this one is there's a four here, and another four, and a one for the distance between j and k. Uh, but the i and k are always the distance four apart, so the minimum is four. Uh, the minimum for, for i and j and uh, i, I and, uh, sorry, j and k yes, is one. So we get that. We get that the, right, the triangular inequality thing is that if you go from here to here, this distance this distance plus this distance should be greater than this distance. It's around the other way. Right, so we have a complete failure of the, what we call a triangle. So it's not a normal kind of space. Um, so this makes sense, right? So if, from a social point of view, so you, you so here you are, uh, you're, a, um, uh, you're a lawyer, and these two people are farmers. Uh, and 
but you like playing basketball, right? So this, v, and so does J. So that in this one, you're connected, play on the same team. And K likes tiddly wings. So they're, 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 you just, you're not going to put it with them. So um, J and K are all over the farming things, they all talk to each other. You can talk about basketball, but this, you know, you're a, you're a uh, what is it, lawyer basketball player, and this is a farmer tiddly wing player. But there's a really easy connection, right? So if you, you know, if you knew that your friend played, you knew your friend had a friend who played tiddly wings, then you could easily get to them. You, you know, you, oh, and we don't have this in the model, but you can know something about your friend's friends, right? They're not your friend, but your friend keeps telling you about this person that you wish to shut up about, but you, you got a man, you brother, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Oh, just even, yeah, of course, the benign version, they just tell you things about what happened at work, school, and you kind of get an idea of uh, their friends. All right, so does that make sense? All right. So usual thing. So we we uh, so we have these identity vectors now, and so we'll have the individuals knowing the vectors of themselves, their friends, and the target person. Uh, and then, well, I'm not get that. so uh, then you can now now you have this capacity, right? So people can estimate the distance between. Uh, of course, they they know they know about their friends. So they they have their friends vectors and the target vector, and they can easily see. So if the target person is a tiddly wing playing farmer, and you know a farmer who plays basketball, and you know it because you, you play basketball together, then uh, you compare their vectors in your head, and of course that's not what you do, but you say that they're both, play, they're both farmers, right? So uh, then you think there's a chance. So you move the, the ball into the mess. And then we use a greedy algorithm, and we do something, we add a piece in that's not been in these other models yet. Uh, we allow searches to fail because that's a that's something that was in Milgram's. It's a very natural part of uh, it was in Milgram's law Milgram's experiment, our experiment, uh, it's a very natural thing to, to have. Alright. Very good? Very good. So here's an example. We did all sorts of silly things. Uh, kind of the computers we had at that at that time sort of limited what they could do. It's pretty embarrassing I guess. Um, they were, you know, I did my whole PhD with, uh, it had 800 megs on the hard drive, which was, and it had Linux and Windows and all, all room left over. It's like a brick, it's a monstrous Toshiba. Um, anyway, I thought it was huge. Uh, when I was a young student, all right. <laughs> Let's see, so this is Alfred Zero and Alfred was the the reason we want to put in alpha equals zero, that's the random connection, right? And that's, that's okay. So that gives us kind of more of an original small world model. But that's, a very, that's not a very realistic uh, behavior. Um, and then we have alpha equals two, and that's where we're, the, the decay and probability of connecting to someone is pretty strong. So you're going to connect to people in your group. In the next group adjacent, the next group's adjacent in the hierarchy, maybe a little further out, but you're not going to connect to someone on the other side of the hierarchy. Low probability of doing so. So it's a social kind of feel to it. And they're all doing the same thing, making those connections. And we're going to have a, uh, a failure story in here. So this is, a, this is a probably that a, a message reaches the target. We have some you know, failure rate in here. So this is the number of hierarchies across here. And so two things happen. So if we have the, this is the alpha equals zero case. So alpha equals zero is actually pretty good if you have one hierarchy. But as soon as you add more, start to add more and more and more hierarchies, your probability of failure, um, so your probability of success goes down pretty bad. The one where you have uh, that locally reinforced thing, right, where you're adding more links locally in the hierarchy, fails pretty badly for one single hierarchy because you're not, you've still got this big hierarchy. It's pretty nasty. But now if you simply put in two, three, you add more hierarchies, you do pretty well. The reason it still goes down is you start to get confused, right? Everyone seems to be, eventually if you have, if you're, if you're taking every attribute, right? So if you have a thousand attributes of your friends and the target, and one of those attributes is they are a human, I mean, that's basically what you're getting out to, right? Mm -hmm. So 
this is a this is, you know you can't sort it out because you can make equal weight to all. So it's a it's a dopey thing. You know, you, you need to be what we would do naturally is say geography or we, we would have um, you know, some sort of bias on these things. So uh, adding just a few dimensions certainly helps. Uh, we we have people people are randomly allocated in these different dimensions also pretty crazy. Um, and this also tells me the, 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 the hierarchy, if it's really tight branching, so it's two, a branching ratio of two, that's a little weird, but if you can, there's a pretty flexible space in three branching ratios of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to ten, they'll do pretty well. Right, so the exact details of this hierarchy that's describing the identity doesn't matter too much. So here's a silly thing that we did. We said, all right, well, let's try to kind of replicate in the, this is sort of absurd, we got it anyway. 100 million uh, people, we'll put that into our model. Um, this is what almost made it. it was, we'll say groups are about 100 within each hierarchy. Decent. I mean, it's, it's a lot, but it, this is, so this is a Dunbar number thing, right? Dunbar's number, if you don't know about it, is the idea that we can handle about 150 people in our hands, and that's a result of evolution. They have all sorts of work on what whales can do, and dolphins, and different uh, uh, apes and hominids and so on. And there's a scaling, right? There's a pod size and there's your local family and how that scales. Okay. So interestingly, we, we see that on Twitter, for example. You can you, you see this kind of thing popping up to 150. Below 150, people are behaving like they're narrow casting, which means that they're communicating with friends. And after that, they change a little bit in their behavior because now they've got a thousand friends. It's a different game. Uh, you can see the information level peaks around 150. It, so this it crops up in a lot of areas, but we so we so that's sort of roughly there. like a thousand is too much. You can't you can't figure out a thousand. You can't remember them all. Uh, and this is the average number of friends total. So we're going to add these links. So you've got three hundred of these drawers to add links. Right? To start with, you don't have any friends in this thing, and then we use this little exponential for adding links. Um, yeah. So. Uh, that's that's actually not bad. So that turns out to be uh, also based on real data, and it's uh, Kilworth. Um, and it was an estimate at some point, a very startlingly accurate one. Of 291 was the average number of friends that people in the US had, based on. And so there are funny ways to do this, right? So you ask people how many people they know called Michael or you know, Frida or something. You, have this kind of, you can ask them these things, and then you look at the census data and try to uh, estimate how many people are really know. Uh, there's some more recent work that puts it at 500 or 600 or something. But kind of funny thing to do. And then there'll be all these gradations of friendships, right? You have some three or four or five, or six that are really close friends. Anyway, we're eliciting that information more and more. But it's really recent, ten years. Um, good thing is. Oh, so, so the branching ratio on this is 10, so, so, so you have occupation in 10 major categories, 10 major categories under that. Uh, we have alpha equals 1, which is a little uh, looser than the 2, but it's not, it's not 0, right? so it's not out at the random things. And just two hierarchies. Um, so we ran this, and we took you know, random starts, random targets, and did over and over. And this is if you take the, um, the people who started, this is sort of insane. But people who started in Nebraska and ended up at, uh, finding the target person for Melbourne's experiment. The, the, so that's what the yellow is here. And this is from our model. So it's not bad. I mean, it's insane. You know, we, we, this piece is not, this piece we just made up, right? Alfred was one, it's sort of, a, it's in between. It's not that bad. You know, these numbers are based on real things. This is kind of roughly the uh, population of the US at the time. Uh, and so, Okay. And we put in the failure rate as well, right? So we put in that probably the failure that no one So I can't believe we did this. Anyway, so it's 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 actually sort of not out of the out of the book. All right, so that's that's pretty good. All right, so that was uh, 2002. Uh, you yeah, know that paper's done well. It's got 700 and something citations, um, which is not. As I said, you can you can get many more. Of, if you've started a whole field, but it's done, it's done well. Uh, a little bit of work that I know about that's, I mean, this is much that's come after it, there's a little bit of work uh, that, that really try to get at that, these 
what these hierarchies are, what these spaces are that represent these identities. If you like. And so uh, Lada was working at HP, so she had a nice uh, data set to see in front of her. And so a couple of pieces, so she's looking at the problem of connections between people as a function of organizational distance of where they are in some organizational chart. Um, you know, there's a reporting chart. Um, but that was fit by an exponential distribution, so that was consistent with that completely made up idea of how to connect people. Uh, but real distance, so she had actually where people sat, that was a bit different. So this is more like a, because you know, now you're in two dimensions, it really is actually in two dimensions, and that decay is one over R. So probably that you're connected to someone as a function of their physical distance from you know, your desks. Okay, um, more like this. So that, that's a nice one. All right. Uh, you know, real world uses, talked about the whole red balloon thing. Maybe this is too old a slide. Uh, tagging, right? So that's a so so that's a useful thing. You're adding these identity pieces so you can search, right? so you can find things that are adjacent. Um, Amazon, which we've talked about, photo tagging, right? So this this is a big deal. So you can find photos that are adjacent to each other. You're creating these bipartite um, networks, um, which potentially then can be the, the metadata can be organized hierarchically. And, and early on, uh, when Flickr really took off, it was fantastic, right, for um, for finding for finding photos of, of something, right. So if you wanted to find red flowers, you put in red flower, and it would give you red flowers because people would tag their things in a reasonable way. And, and you, it's not just your own tagging; people, many people would tag things, right. So you'd end up with a, a little cloud of tags. Uh, Google was pretty awful early on. Right? It would give you some images, but if it said red flower something on the name, then it would throw that up there. So it would be kind of a scramble. But I don't know what they do now, it's better than um, yeah, Informational objects, uh, and then right, all this sort of stuff. Tagging. Tagging makes these things searchable, and it's whether you can, um, you know, how you can, how you can bring it, how you can make that happen in a natural way, uh, where people are doing a good job, they're investing in it, they're organizing things. Uh, makes all these things searchable. All right, so, uh, yeah, and then the whole red balloon story. There's, there's all these other possibilities. So that's solving the, the uh, incentive problem, which was pretty huge. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, mentioned Amazon, right? It's pretty good. Um, and of course, this is all you know, average people, and then you get the whole expert judgments versus Hoy uh, Hoy. The Hoy Oligoy is the, the very few. Uh, okay, so that's this, and I think uh, I'll have a little summary, but I think we'll start talking about scale free networks. I'll really do the whole thing properly on next, uh, you know, after. So we have spring break, and then you guys are going to present uh, little, little, uh, projects, little pieces, and then we'll come back to all this. So, basic networks are unsearchable, right? With a local search on them. That's, that's just a clear thing. Uh, and uh, if you understand, if you're, if you're a node, you're a part of this thing, if you understand how the network was formed, right, so the network's grown, social networks grow, how they evolve, how they change. Uh, identity seems to be really a key thing when we talk about people. Um, better models of social networks it's still, you know, in some ways we still don't have, we still don't, we have these bipartite affiliation ones and the generalized ones, and they're very good, but we still, we don't have kind of a little test one that everyone uses. Be good actually. Because the generalized affiliation ones are just hard enough to make them a little tougher analytically to deal with. So that keeps the physicists a little further away. <laughs> if, they, if they can get things out analytically, they'll you know, chore to death, right? Because they're primers. But, uh, right. Uh, how, do you, how do you make peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks work well so that things are searchable um, and information that is. Right. Also organization. Right, there's some work at times, I think, within HP, so I think this is human, too. Uh, you know, it's an algorithm to dig through all of your email, which is somewhat basic, obviously, and everything that's on your computer to get topic things, you know, to get out the things that you may or may not know about. You, you don't want to report everything you know just because it's arduous. And, right, but if you, that would help with the whole, let's find someone who knows about this, this particular problem. Or well, let's find seven people who have 
something that might help. And this is the sort of thing that Toyota has done well, famously, and other, other places, but you group together maybe 10, 15 people to solve a problem, and they're from different areas. They, all, they figure it out, they write it up, you know, that's how the whole thing evolves. But I'm giving a kind of diverse group together. So that's a hard problem. How do you find it, the right group to solve the problem? That's just the right person, the right group. How do you put it together? All right. So look, I'll start this. It's just a few minutes left, but I'll, I'll start this. This is the second big piece from the end of the 90s that starts off uh, uh, all of this work on, on uh, networks. And you know, no one had thought about degree distribution at all. They just had it. And uh, Duncan and, and uh, Steve Strogatz, uh, they did all this work across the whole world, and they, they just, the degree distribution was just sitting there, and I'll talk about it. It's just did another thing about it. And of course, no one had done it before, so. Uh, all right, so we know all about these things. So this scale-free is a bit of a funny word here, but uh, it makes sense, of course, when we talk about real scales and real things, uh, but it could be time and so on. These networks aren't necessarily existing in space, right? They're, Informational networks often in some way. So, but many networks seem to have this. So degree distribution having this uh, this uh, decay, right? K to the minus gamma, these horrible things. Uh, and so it's one of the seminal works. And so the original paper is this: emergence of scaling in random networks. It's three or four pages. You should read it. You should read Duncan's as well, of course. If you've done it. Um, they're well written and they're short. Uh, okay. So it's a, it's a bit of a misleading thing. The scale free is a little bit, you know, you, I mean, we know about it for in physics, we're all happy with it, but as you move further out, it has a kind of different flavor to it. Uh, so they're not fractals, right? If you've got, if you've got the fractal t-shirt on, you're sort of shooting um, uh, So we're usually going to have networks that are somehow abstract. We've talked about these things. They're not physical work, because if you have some node that has 10,000 links, that's going to cost a lot to keep them all alive. Uh, if you're a human, right? That's not easy. So, um, the web is a perfect example, right? So, the, that's, that's done very well. Uh, it's, it's a bit tricky, you know, measuring how many links are in and out of places. Google does it, but now it's just such a big thing to get hold of. Earlier on, you'd you know, be able to do it reasonably well. And, and the, the original paper had, I think, the website, the whole domain for Notre Dame, right? That's where, where Baramazi was at the time, so they, they had all the links within. Um, so, just like we've had with Powell's in general, there's a lot of arguing about whether this network or that network is really still free. There's usually heavy tail distributions involved, in that, and that's you know, a huge deal. So, here are a couple of examples, uh, and just to give you kind of a flavor. So, this is Gamma is 2.5. So, we know about 2.5. That means the mean is, right, what's the average de distribution uh, degree for these things? What quality does it have? So 2.5 is between 2 and 3, is the big one. Which one is it? So for that one, the variance is, that one, variance is infinite. And the mean is finite. When you trip over 2, when you go, so when it becomes more skewed, so it's a two that you get of infinite uh, mean as well. And when you go past three, your variance becomes finite. And that, when you go past three, now you're in finite variance, it's not, a, you don't have the statistics of surprise anymore, right? Statistics of small order come in. And uh, so this is very, this is gonna keep, we're gonna keep that exponent the same. Uh, and these are, Realizations of, of uh, random networks, they're not very big ones, uh, but they're random in every other sense, except for the degree distribution. So we're going to specify the degree distribution, randomize it. So this is a bit like an XP, right? I've used this, this network plotting thing that you could script and go on with. Gephi might be a better um, but these are the largest, these are the giant components, right? So there's more to this network, but there are a few little guys that have one frame or zero frames and two or three frames and just taking them away. This is what the, the center looks like in realizing these things. So you can see this hub-like structure, right? There are a few hubs in here. Uh, and you can see the kind of the, uh, the flukiness of it as well. So this one doesn't really have a strong, 
and there's not, none of these guys in here have tons of friends. Uh, same here and same here, uh, but we got some big ones in here. So this is the whole, you know, this is the earthquake sampling, right? So uh, it's a relatively small network, but it's possible you get some huge characters in there. Right? So it's a little more fluky. If these were random networks and we were sampling from the same distribution, they'd all look basically the same for all the purple. Um, the average grid is pretty low, pretty low, yeah. but all right. So, uh, I think I'll finish with this paper, but I want to say, so you can see a couple of things that are, that are going to happen in the ones that have these hubs, right? So, let's say a disease starts here, and these nodes all can act in the same way, meaning that, uh, say, at every time step, we have sort of a discrete time step of some rate. Think about rates, but let's think about discrete time step. This one starts yabbering on about an idea, or they get a disease, and then everyone else has some chance of being infected. If it gets to this one, then you're in big trouble, right? But if, we'll, we'll see later on that they're very different, depending on the contagion process, very different things can happen if, if it's a very simple kind of disease-like one, so that this individual is somehow in contact with all these other neighbors all the time, it gets its disease then, well, really disastrous, right? So there's a result about that. There's no so-called epidemic threshold for these guys. There's no way you can kind of dial the disease down to, uh, to stop it from spreading. It will always take off, even if it's not very infectious, in an average sense. Uh, if it's more of a social type one, there's some different types of contagion that are fit into what we call social contagion, lots of different ones. Now you have memory in, in odd ways. You, you need to hear from different sources, and so on. But let's say this person is jabbering on about some idea. This is Oprah, and everyone else is talking about things, right? So then they hear this one thing about uh, how you know, shirts with frogs on them are great, and they're just like, yeah, right, okay. right? So they don't hear it. But if they hear it from here and here and here, then okay. maybe that's a thing. Um, I have to say that one of the upshots, you know, there are many kind of good things to, to, to come out of here that you know, understand about the real world. If you see something for the first time, you think, wow, that's cool, and no one knows about that except me. It's usually very, very wrong, right? Because the fact that you've sampled it at all suggests that it's probably everywhere. <laughs> you have to be very careful, right? Because you've got people who look, well, you didn't see it anywhere else, you have to be kind of careful with this. You know, you see some YouTube video or whatever. Of course, you can see the counts on this, but you think, ah, oh, no one knows about this, you know? Um, <clears throat> Especially with informational networks, the way they spread. You know, you're out in the fringe here. None of you guys are fringe dwellers, I'm sure. But, uh, but you know, for a particular outbreak of some, some news. So that's, that's contagion. Thinking about robustness, so we'll talk about this. Obviously, if you can target this character, then the whole thing starts to fall apart. So that's a pretty straightforward thing. That's much less true for random networks, because no one's a big up in there. Uh, and then there's a, this is an old work as well, we'll talk about this, there's a distinction can be made between random failures. So random failures in these systems are actually pretty good. Because the chance that you randomly break the big connected one is low. Um, whereas targeted ones are dangerous. Now what's sort of left out of a lot of those analyses, if this is Google, for example, I mean Google is not just one little point with lots of friends, right? It's very different in kind to this point out here, which is just an enormous distributed set of computers that, um, that it will be, I don't know, almost impossible to shut down. And, and when that was sort of taking off though, when you did have some service that was becoming bigger and bigger, then it was possible to shut down. And there's denial of service attacks, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, so it's kind of an arms race. Uh, but at some point we started to distribute content all over the place. So you, know, you go to Google, you don't necessarily, you don't go to one machine, right? you go to some place and it feeds things back and it's very, there's lots of redundancy. So we've been building the robust to um, So, all right, so the next thing will be to think about a mechanism for where these come from. It will be the rich gets richer story, it ties completely to Simon, but uh, it was not connected to that back at the time, right? That's fine. I mean, this was observed with real networks, that data came online. Um, <coughs> Uh, and we um, you know, and put forward a mechanism, we can see it's similar to Simon's mechanism, uh, and it all connects. So 
that's the story we'll, we'll go into a couple of weeks from now. But, all right, that works.